okay? But my dedicated section is cybersecurity labeling. And the slide we have on screen right now is a screenshot of the FDA's most current guidance document for cybersecurity labeling. It's the content of pre-market submissions for management of cybersecurity and medical devices. This is the most active guidance document for this topic the FDA has. You hit the next slide, Rob. Unfortunately, if you look at the PDF revision, labeling isn't even mentioned in the guidance document. And that's what makes cybersecurity labeling such an interesting topic right now is because we're kind of uh, in between suggestions and guidance for, for how to be compliant with what the FDA is looking for in free market submissions. Next slide. Fortunately for us, they have a draft guidance that was issued in 2018, which you'll notice is well beyond its 150 day comment period, but it's still in its draft revision, which means it's not for implementation and still only contains non binding recommendations. But compared to 2014, which is the release date of the final revision of the previous guidance, that's older than all of my children. It's, it's outdated and cybersecurity is advancing faster than we're adopting guidance documents to keep up with it. Next slide. For the draft guidance, you'll notice that compared to the current one, labeling is mentioned a total of 20 times. Not only is it included in this revision of the guidance, it has a dedicated section for labeling recommendations. And it gives you acceptance criteria. This is for devices with cybersecurity risks. Next slide. So when you ask yourself, does this apply to me? Does my device have a cybersecurity risk? You can ask yourself a handful of questions and it's usually pretty easy to figure out. Does your device have user management permission configuration? Are there users and admin level permissions that, that your device utilizes? Does it have something as simple as a username and login for access? Does it connect to a network or is it part of the ever growing internet of things? Can your device be accessed remotely? Or as simple as does it have a USB port? If the answer to any of those questions is yes, you probably have cybersecurity risks. Next slide. The good news is to reference a uh, previous slide we went over, you've already done this. For section six, you've created a specific list of all of the cybersecurity risks that you considered during the design of your device. So if you've gotten this far, you know if it's applicable or not. Next slide. One of the things you can do is because this is specific, our presentation today is specific to 510K applications, we can operate under the assumption that you have at least one predicate device that your device is substantially equivalent to in safety and efficacy. Just by nature, this isn't, this isn't a, a breakthrough application for de novo. This is a 510K. There are other devices already on the market similar to yours. The FDA has cybersecurity safety communications that they release. Leverage this for devices similar to yours to figure out what's applicable for cybersecurity risks to your device. Next slide. What this cybersecurity communications are, are vulnerabilities that the FDA has acknowledged in cases where they don't know of patient injury or death, but if unmitigated, could lead to patient harm or could lead to compromise of protected information. So this is what's already been out there and has been acknowledged. So if you're in the process of your 510K submission, Look at what's happening to the predicate devices around your device to see what applies to yours. Next slide. So this is a quote taken from the draft guide. So again, not for implementation is only a non-binding recommendation, but the next slide will show us the important bullet points to take away. Your labeling for your 510k is something that's going to communicate the relevant security information to your end users, whether that's going to be patients or healthcare providers. And the purpose of it is to help the manufacturers ensure that your device remains safe and effective through its entire product life cycle, not just during development and not just during the post-market phase, but from start to finish. Next slide. The draft guidance 
which now has a dedicated labeling section, contains a total of 14 recommendations that they want to include in your pre-market submission. Fortunately, we don't have enough time to go through all 14 of the recommendations, but I've cherry picked a few of them that give us some good examples of the information that the FDA is looking for. And when we get towards the end, there's a 15th one that I would just personally recommend based on other standards. Next slide. So for recommendation number two, the FDA suggests that you include a description of the device features that protect critical functionality, even when the device's cybersecurity has been compromised. The best example I could think of for this, and I'm biased because I, I came to the regulatory field from pre-hospital care, is if you consider uh, most ambulances generally have what, what we collo colloquially referred to as a life pack. It was just a combination AED ECG machine. The older ones, you got a paper printout that read your heart rhythm. The fancy new ones could electronically send that to the receiving hospital. In the event of a cybersecurity compromise, the critical functionality of that type of device is that it's a manual ECG and defibrillator. That's the important part. You need to make sure that the, those features are what's protected even in a compromise so that if uh, login credentials are are compromised and you can't, your users can't send the digital information, it still needs to function as an AED or an ECG. And that's what needs to be protected. Next slide. As, as we get through these recommendations, they get a little bit bigger, but they build on top of each other. And there was, there was a reason that I chose the one. Number, so recommendation number six is a list of network ports and other interfaces that are expected to receive and or send data and a description of port functionality and whether the ports are incoming or outgoing. And they include a note that says unused ports should be disabled, which is absolutely a cybersecurity best practice. Uh, one of the favorite ways for malware to make it onto your system is through an open port. And they don't always immediately damage anything they'll sit in an open port and just monitor the information that goes back and forth through that particular port. Now, all of your networks use ports and most of them have dedicated functions. So when you send an email, emails go out and come in through dedicated ports. And they're given a number and all ports are uh, categorized. So if you're not using a port for a specific function, best practice is to close it but tell your end user and your labeling what ports your device is going to use. Because as a basic cybersecurity practice, you should be closing the ports that you are not using. Next slide. And this one is an absolutely massive wall of text and nobody likes it when you just read word for word from a PowerPoint slide. If we go to the next point there, the next slide, I've highlighted the bullet points to really take away from this. They also want you to include a CBOM, a configurable bill of materials that contains your commercial, open source, OTS software, and the hardware components for the purpose of helping your end users manage their assets, understand the potential impact of identified vulnerabilities, and my favorite, deploy countermeasures. Your labeling needs to be proactive. You need to help the end user stop identified vulnerabilities. And that's because when you're discussing cybersecurity, there's a lot of things that are outside of what the manufacturer has control over. You have a network connected device, you don't have control over the network administration of your end user. So some of these countermeasures and how to mitigate threats that you have identified need to happen at the network level and only the user that controls the network can do that. But your labeling has the responsibility to communicate that information to them. And this is part of why I like the topic of labeling so much here is because it represents uh, the perfect overlap between risk management, cybersecurity, and human factors engineering. This is really what makes the end user interact with your device. Next slide. So we've covered a lot of broad things about labeling in particular, but what we don't have is a great itemized list of 
these are the exact documents that the FDA wants to take a look at. What I have on the screen now is a screen capture from the FDA's E-STAR submission process. And I did an A-B comparison for the E-STAR submissions they have open. And cybersecurity labeling is identical both for medical devices and in vitro diagnostic devices. So this section on both E-STAR applications is identical. Next slide. Why I brought that up is because they have a specific cybersecurity labeling section. And if you look at the right-hand column, this is, this is just a screenshot of a PDF that they, they provide for download on the FDA's website. But those question marks open up a better explanation of the information that the FDA is looking for. These are the question marks that tell you this is what, this is what your deliverable to the FDA is. Next slide. And this is just a, a cropped screenshot of what we were looking at with the, the question mark. The FDA wants your labeling, which includes your instructions for use in your product specifications, related to recommended cybersecurity controls appropriate for the intended use environment. So when you're developing your labeling, you need to think of it in the manner that it's the intended use of your device in its intended use environment where it's being interacted with by the intended users. But you have to trace this all the way back to your risk assessment because it needs to be consistent with the controls you described in your assessment. And you have to provide any configuration items that are necessary on the computer or the computer platform that your end user is using. And they give some examples like recommending pop-ups to be blocked and, and cybersecurity guidances. And they, they re-reference uh, section six, item five. But this is the best I can come up with for an itemized list of what the FDA is looking for for your cybersecurity labeling. As cybersecurity grows, what we're going to see happen in, in particular reference to instructions for use is we're going to have to, as manufacturers, just dedicate a section to cybersecurity. That's really where the industry is heading. We have to do this now. Uh, right now, our guidances are sort of in a, in a draft position, but you can see the requirements from the E-STAR application very closely mimic the non-binding, not for implementation recommendations of the draft guidance. So even though it's just a draft, it's kind of what's driving what the FDA is looking for. Next slide. When you consider what you should include in your labeling, both to meet the regulatory requirements and to help the user provide the most robust cybersecurity that they can, you can look at other standards. And I picked this one in particular because this is what my 15th recommendation would be. And it's the ISO standard on vulnerability disclosure. Now it's a final thing of what should you tell your end users that you couldn't mitigate through design? What do they have to do to address those vulnerabilities that only the end user would? And that's an example, like when we were talking about network connected devices, you don't have control over what the systems administration of your end user does. You can tell them what they should do, but you don't have direct control over it. And you'll see that this standard's in its uh, 2018 re date revision, which is the second edition. Next slide. The other one to consider is very closely related. It was released in 2019, and it's just your vulnerability handling process. And it provides a good picture of the processes you have to go through, and you can identify what would be applicable to the manufacturer versus what would be applicable to the end user. And it can help you when you're developing your instructions for use, how to guide the end user and what they need to do on their end. And usually it's because you don't have control as the manufacturer over that area. Next slide. <clears throat> Unfortunately, and the reason I emphasize the second edition and the date revisions of those standards is what I have on screen now is a screen capture of the recognized standards from the FDA. 
you'll notice that as a standard designation number, the FDA recognizes both of those standards. However, if you look at the date revision, you'll see that the FDA is still currently taking the first edition or the 2013 and 2014 editions of those standards. So you have to be, you have to juggle the regulatory compliance that the FDA recognizes the, the first edition with the understanding that the second edition is going to be the accepted state of the art standard and you need to do your best to blend the two of those together. Next slide. The FDA has other guidance documents outside of what the International Standards Organization or the IEC may have released. What the FDA offers is a guidance document on cybersecurity for networked medical devices containing off-the-shelf software. Uh, what I've seen with this is software components of devices that are both hardware and software. It's not always software that was explicitly designed for the purpose of being used in a medical device. This is going to help you tie in your soup to the design of your device, you know, software of unknown products. And they have a guidance available for that. Unfortunately, it's even more outdated than the content of pre-market submissions. This is back in 2005. Cybersecurity as an industry has exploded since then, but this is the most up-to-date that the FDA has released. Next slide. This guidance was touched on a little bit throughout the presentation, but they have a guidance on post-market management of cybersecurity of medical devices. This is very important to labeling because this is involved in more than just the 510K application. Your labeling is more than just the stickers on your packaging. And it's something that needs to be a living, breathing thing that you take care of throughout the entire life cycle of your device. Now the guidance date for this is 2016, but this is for post-market management of cybersecurity and devices. Next slide. Now, I have also included a terrifying wall of text that I promise I'm not going to read word for word. But the next slide we go to is going to highlight the important part. And that is labeling in reference to your cybersecurity routine updates and patches, include your product labeling and your instructions for use. So when you make patches to your device and your routine updates, the expectation from the, the FDA is that it's also your user manual and your quick start guide and the information that you're communicating to your end users for how to use your device. And if you make modifications to that for the purpose of strengthening cybersecurity, it's part of a routine update and patch. You're supposed to do it, but the FDA also recognizes that it's part of the routine update and patches and usually doesn't require that you have to report those updates. It's part of your cybersecurity management. Next slide. And that, in, in a nutshell, at sort of warp speed, because I know that we're, we're running low on time, that is what the labeling considerations are for the FDA if you're, you're building a 510K submission. So I can hand the presentation.